great and marvelous are thy works, O Lord. In thy fear shall I worship towards your holy temple. Amen. O come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our Maker. Hear us, O Lord, when we call. For we acknowledge our transgressions. Turn us again, O God, and cause thy face to shine. O Lord, hear, I pray, the voice of my supplications. If thou, Lord, shouldest mark iniquities, O Lord, who shall stand? But with thee there is forgiveness that thou mayest be feared. I wait for the Lord. My soul doth wait, and in his word do I hope. For with the Lord there is mercy, and with him is plenteous redemption. Amen. Be pleased, O Lord, to deliver us. O Lord, be pleased to help us. Show us thy mercy, O Lord. Lord, our Heavenly Father, we study your word. We ask for guidance and light. We feel blessed with the gifts of freedom and rationality that our minds may explore the teachings and that we may understand and grasp what you are telling us. Lord, help us to follow the precepts that you have given us. Lord, we know that you do not mark iniquities, that is, keep score over the things we have done wrong, but your constant effort is to draw us towards yourself, to bless us, to make us happy, to allow us to dwell with you and in you, and to love one another as you love us. Lord, give us the strength to follow things freely, the things that you have spoken in your word, that we may come to you, that you may knock upon the door of our hearts, and we may open and say, Come, Lord. Amen. Our Father, who art in the heavens, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done, as in heaven, so upon the earth. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we also forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Keep us in thy name, O Lord. be to the Lord God, our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Please turn in your liturgies to number 391, where we will say in responsive reading that selection of the Psalm 119 that is found in verses 169 to 176, number 391. Let my cry come before you, O Lord. Let my supplication come before you. My lips shall utter praise. My tongue shall speak of your word. Let your hand become my help. I long for your salvation, O Lord. Let my soul live, and it shall praise you. 
I have gone astray like a lost sheep. Please be seated. Our first lesson has to do with a lost lamb and some other lost things. Taken from the Gospel of Luke chapter 15. All the tax collectors and the sinners drew near to Jesus to hear him. The Pharisees and the scribes complained, saying, This man receives sinners and he eats with them. So the Lord spoke to them, saying, What man of you, having a hundred sheep, if one of them goes astray, does he not leave the ninety-nine in the wilderness and go after the one that is lost until he finds it? And when he has found it, he lays it upon his shoulders, rejoicing. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and his neighbors, saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found my lost sheep. I say to you that likewise there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over ninety-nine just persons who do not need repentance. Or what woman, having ten coins, ten silver coins, if she loses one of them, does she not light a lamp, sweep the house, and search carefully until she finds it? And when she has found it, she calls her friends and neighbors, saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found that peace which I have lost. Likewise, I say to you, there is more joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. Amen. So do any of you see what might be a lost lamb here? Nobody does? Okay, some of the grown-ups are... Yeah. Do any of the children see what might be a lost lamb? What do you think? You think that, no. This, you think, look at this. How could this big fella get lost, right? This is not the lost lamb. There is, there is a lamb that I put somewhere that is sort of like the lost lamb. How many of you can see maybe some silver coins? Ooh. Hmm. I'm going to close the uh, Holy Supper rail because I'm going to ask you to come forward and look for the lost lamb and for the lost coins. Now, you might find that there is a not lost lamb and you might find that there are nine not lost coins, but I'm telling you, there is one lost lamb and one lost coin. And anybody like to come forward and look? Now, you don't go beyond this. It's just in this area here. You might find it. No? You might find it, Julian. You might want to try to look. See if you can find lost coins or a lost lamb. Now, how many coins are there? Can you count them? You can pick them up and give them to me. See if we can count them all out. Nine. Now, do you remember in the story how many coins the woman had? Ten. Ten. So, that's not ten, is it? How many are missing? What, good job. Where do you think that lost coin is? What about the sheep? Do you think there's a lost sheep? You could look for that lost sheep somewhere. Not that one. Yeah. Warmer. 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 You know what that means when I say warmer? Okay. Colder. Warmer. Warmer. Keep looking, keep looking, because it's in, in the looking, folks. It's in the looking that the Lord's story is taking place here. In the looking. Keep looking, keep going. You're, uh, uh, no, 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 don't give up. Keep going, keep going, keep going. Oh, look, Annika's trying to help back there. How's it going? Oh, shy, there we go. Thank you, Ella. Bring that over here. Put it right here. So we found the little lost lamb. Can you put it on your shoulders and say, Rejoice with me, for I found my lost lamb? Excellent. Put that lost lamb. Okay, so we're going to have to sweep the whole place. That's what it said. So you find any way to sweep? It said the woman had to sweep. Sweep the house. She lit a candle. We have lights. 
She had to sweep the house. Look at there it is. Okay, put that with the other one. We found our tenth coin. It was actually taped to the broom. Thank you. So when the Lord was talking to all these people, he was talking to everybody. He didn't, he didn't look at people and go, oh, I'm sorry, but you're wearing pink today. I'm not talking to people wearing pink. Oh, I'm sorry. All you women, I just want to talk to the men. And uh, all you old people, I just want to talk to the kids. When the Lord went out to teach, he talked to everyone. And some people said, hey, He's talking to those nasty people that take money from us and give it to the Romans. He's talking to tax collectors. I don't like him. I don't, he's talking to the wrong people. He's talking to those people that we don't like. We don't associate with those people. So the Pharisees, it said, the Sadducees, they thought they were better than other people. They said, hey, we only hang out and talk to good people in our life. We only associate with people that are like us, good people like us. And this Jesus, he's talking to everybody. He's talking to sinners. He's talking to women that sweep up. He's talking to shepherds that look for lost. He's talking to everybody. So the Lord actually told them this parable about the lost lamb. He said, if you had 99 sheep and one of them was lost, you'd go looking for it. And you'd be happy. So the Lord, he says, the angels are happy over one person who repents more than the 99 who are doing the right thing. It's good to do the right thing. But... You have to look and find. The Lord was looking to find the people that needed help. And what if you had ten coins and you lost one? You're going to find it just by sitting around? No. You're going to actually look for it. The Lord was out looking for people that needed his help. He went out looking for them. And when they found him, he was happy. And when they found him, the people who didn't like sinners weren't happy. So he had to teach them too. You know what? Be happy for everybody. We all need that lesson because sometimes we look at other people that are a little different from us in many different ways or any different way and we go, oh, maybe I don't want to talk to them so much. I want to talk to that person. That person's pretty. That person wears the kind of clothes I like. That person is you know, like kind of my kind of person. And those other people, well, mm, I don't know. Maybe I don't need to talk to them. So it said Jesus went and talked to everyone. And when people were upset, he told them about the parable of the lost sheep, the lost coin, and also one about a lost son, of a young man who went off and left his home and came back and realized, I'm lost. I need my, my dad's help, my mom's help. And he came back, and the Lord was really telling the story about all of us. We get lost, and we need to look, continue to look for the Lord, and he will find us. Even though it looks like we're looking, the Lord's always looking for us to help us do better. Amen. Let us pray. To look for you, we know you're looking for us. You're looking to help us. And you rejoice when you find us and help us. Lord, help us to look for you. Help us to think about the things that are coming from your commandments so that we may do them and be in your kingdom. Amen. Grace, mercy, and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come. Amen. Thank mm -hmm. you.
Our second lesson is Psalm 119, the same lesson that we said as a responsive reading, those same verses from that same Psalm 119. Let my cry come before you, O Lord. Give me understanding according to your word. Let my supplication come before you. Deliver me according to your word. My lips shall utter praise, for you teach me your statutes. My tongue shall speak your word, for your commandments are righteousness. Let your hand become my help, for I have chosen your precepts. I long for your salvation, O Lord, and your law is my delight. Let my soul live, and it shall praise you. And let your judgments help me. I have gone astray like a lost sheep. Seek your servant, for I do not forget your commandments. Amen. The third lesson is taken from selections from the work Divine Providence, parts of number 119 to 121. In 118, the heading is given, Therefore, a person has to put away evils from their external self as if by themselves. It goes on to explain in 119 what that means. The Lord can then purify a person of their lusts for evils in their internal and the evils themselves in their external. The Lord purifies a person of lusts for evil when the person puts away the evils as though of themselves because the Lord cannot purify a person before the person does that themselves. Evils reside in the external self, and the lusts for evil, or the desire, or the other word is concupiscences, these reside in the internal. The two go together, like roots and a trunk. Unless the evils are put away by the person in the external, therefore, they block the way for the Lord to put away the evils on the internal. The Lord is continually urging and pressing a person to open the door to him. This is what he meant when he said, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and I will sup with him and he with me. But a person is completely ignorant of what is going on in the interiors of their mind. And yet an infinite number of things are taking place, none of which come to their consciousness. Many people believe that simply believing what the church teaches purifies a person of their evils. And then a list is given of all the other false things we might think that purify us from our evils. Many people think that simply believing what the church teaches purifies a person of their evils. Others believe that doing good purifies a person of their evils. Others believe that knowing, speaking, and teaching the matters that the church teaches purifies people of their evils. Some believe that reading the Word and books of piety, this purifies them of their evils. Some people believe that going to church often Hearing sermons, and especially taking the Holy Supper, this purifies them of their evils. Others believe that renouncing the world, pursuing a life of piety, this purifies them of their evils. And still others believe that confessing that they are sinners of the worst kind, guilty of all sins, this purifies them of their evils. None of these, however, purifies a person of their evils, unless they examine themselves, see their sins, acknowledge them, confess themselves to be sinners before the Lord, repents and desists and begins a new life. All this must be done as if from themselves, yet with the acknowledgement that they do so with the power of the Lord. Amen. Here end our lessons from the Word. Blessed are those who hear the Word of God and keep it. Amen.
Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Amen. Please be seated. It is a law of divine providence. We read in Divine Providence 100, and it's the heading for a whole chapter. It's a law of divine providence that a person, as if out of themselves, should remove evils as sins in their external man, and thus and no otherwise can the Lord remove evils in the internal man, and at the same time in the person's external. The first law of divine providence is that the person must act, we must act, in freedom according to reason. Anything that happens to us, anything that goes on within our spirits or in our minds, outside of our own freedom, and outside of what we believe to be rational or the use of our rationality, none of that sticks. So before we're of a mature age, we can't be reformed and regenerated. The Lord can only reform and regenerate us, that means make us into an angel, according to the use of the freedom that he plants within us, the faculty of freedom and the faculty of rationality. Freedom of the will and also of the understanding, but freedom especially for us to desire whatever we want and for us to rationally or consider the best we can with the understanding that the Lord's given us and that we, as if from ourselves, develop. In freedom and rationality, we make our choices knowing that we'll choose what's good because the Lord gives us the power to do so. So freedom and rationality, that's the first law of divine providence, that a person must act in freedom according to their reason. And the second is that the Lord can only remove evils and repent, have us repent and have us reform and regenerate us insofar as we shun evils as sins in the external, stop doing Stop doing evils. And then the Lord can change us on the internal, in the internal desires that we have planted within us. And at the same time, in the external. Now thus, these are just a couple of the laws of divine providence. We're studying that book in a study group that meets on Thursdays. Please feel free to join us even if you haven't come before. We're studying the books of the, of the, the excuse me, we're studying the book of divine providence. And we've gotten up to these two laws, looking at them. What do you believe changes you from being a not regenerate, angelic person to being a regenerate person? Or do you even think like that? Do you think that you're a regenerate person? Do you think the church allows you or the word gives you a reason to think that you're being regenerated? A lot of people with a sense of humility and maybe some with a sense of false humility say, oh, no, 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 the Lord's, I'm not talking. That's for angels. That's for good people. But me, no, no. Because you think, well, if you say, if you make that claim, it's probably arrogant and evil to even think the Lord's working with you. We have heard that a lot in the church growing up. And today, even, people will say, well, we don't talk about ourselves as being regenerate. There's an analogy among people who are addicts who have stopped being addicts. Can you say that you are a recovered alcoholic? Can you say that you're a recovered addict? Some people say, absolutely not. That's like saying I'm regenerated. Well, an analogy that I've heard that I like relative to this is to say, you know, I got shot once and I lived. I'm a recovered gunshot victim. Now, being a recovered gunshot victim doesn't make me bulletproof, right? Being in a state of recovery from an evil, a bad habit, addiction, being in a state of recovery doesn't make you bulletproof. Doesn't mean you can't go right back to that behavior, those evils that were taking you out and you were acting out of them. The same thing with regeneration. It's a model, actually, that has been used in the recovery movement or the 12-step program that is what I'm talking from, the, the philosophy that's mentioned there, because so much of it comes from the teachings of the new church. That idea that the Lord is regenerating you. If you don't think the Lord's regenerating you, go to the Lord and ask him, why isn't he doing his job? Because that's his job, to regenerate you. 
And you'll say, well, of course the Lord will respond. Well, are you doing your job? Law number two of the divine providence is how you need to do, how we need to do our job so the Lord can do his job. The Lord can't regenerate a person unless that person refrains from evils on the outside. If you are a recovering chocolate addict, or alcoholic addict, or cocaine, or methamphetamine, or barbiturates, or sugar, or sex, or gambling, if you're a recovering person from one of those or any other addictive or evil behavior, you know that you must refrain from repeating the behavior. One is too many, a thousand is way too much. You can't have one hit of cocaine if you're a cocaine addict. You know that you have to eat, but if you're a sugar addict or a carbohydrate addict, or a food addict, you have to practice a program of really careful adherence to principles to keep you from slipping back into that addictive behavior. If you're an alcoholic, you don't drink alcohol. You might say, well, I could take it maybe during Holy Supper. I might be able to take it once in a while, but for the most part, generally people say, I just can't drink. You know, the Lord can't reform us unless we say to ourselves, you know, I'm an adulterer. At heart, I incline to evils of every kind. My major problem is adultery, is stealing, is lying. Again, if, you're, if we're doing our part, we will identify what it is within our hearts and within our behaviors that particularly take us out Take us away from the Lord's kingdom. What is it? What do we incline to? The word tells us we incline to evils of every kind. So don't think you're special if you think you have a unique set of evils. We're all inclined to evils of every kind. Each of us individually, through our DNA, through our heredity, through the things that we've grown up doing, incline to certain evils more than others. Nobody likes to talk about evils. The Lord doesn't want to talk about evils. It's the only way, talking about evils, is the only way we can be on the road to spiritual recovery, which is regeneration. We do it by steps of repentance, reformation, and regeneration. We have to refrain. We have to desist, stop doing the evils on the outside that we're inclined to. That's the only way the Lord can do his work to regenerate you. He will do his work. We have to, as if of ourselves, say, what, what do I need to stop doing that is not so good? Evil. Just call it evil. And we're told that we should especially do this on a regular basis as we approach the Lord's table. As we approach Holy Supper to say, Lord, I especially need help with my desire to be dishonest. What is that desire to be dishonest? How does it manifest itself? You do your examination. You can write the Lord a letter and burn it later on. You can talk to your partner. You can talk to a trusted friend. You can talk to your pastor. You can talk to spiritual leaders or people that you trust. It says it's good for us to be able to do that. It's good for us to be able to confess our sins, especially to the Lord, but even to take it and confess to somebody else. Whether it's a pastor, whether it's a psychotherapist, whether it's just somebody that you really trust, tell them you're struggling with the desire to cheat on your taxes. I see a few people squirm when I say that. Even if you haven't cheated on your taxes, the government takes way too much of our money, right? So maybe we should find a way to not pay exactly what we owe them. It's a tough one. Keeping the Sabbath. Are we keeping the Sabbath? How do we keep the Sabbath? Let's think about that. We could go through all ten commandments. We can go through all the books of the second coming and find just so many different varieties of evils that we can incline to. They're there so that we can identify and say, that's not something that I want to be doing anymore. I need to desist from that evil. 
all of us are inclined to evils of every kind. Have I mentioned that before? And it's worth repeating because we oftentimes think we're worse than other people, and on the flip side, we think other people are worse than us. We need to each look at our external. That is, what behaviors are we doing? What are we doing? Did we actually sign something and know that it wasn't completely true? Don't do that. Did we actually say something to somebody and know that by saying what we just said, we've left a less than good impression about somebody else? We've been gossiping. Don't do that. Or we're listening to people that are telling stories about one another. And we're encouraging by, by listening more intently or showing interest in a discussion that we really need to say, mm, I don't want to talk about that. How about them Blue Jays? Change the subject. We could go through all of the Ten Commandments and look at ways that we break those commandments. And if we think we're perfect, we should look at that even more. What would we, why would we think that we're so perfect? The highest angels of heaven continually are brought to a state of acknowledgement concerning their own evils and thank the Lord continuously and strongly, powerfully, that they are withheld from those evils. Do they know that they're regenerate? Do they know that they're not regenerating themselves or keeping themselves regenerate? Yes. They constantly praise the Lord and thank Him for withholding them from their evils. And going back to using the analogy of somebody who might be addicted to this or that process or substance. The program in the 12 Steps acknowledges some higher power and a lot of freedom is left as to what that power is. We in this church would say it's the Lord God Jesus Christ, the divine human glorified by means of, and we can go into a lot of doctrinal thought, but the, the divine, the Lord, the divine love and wisdom is our higher power, constantly desiring to marry in our own minds what is good and what is true, to help us see in freedom what is evil and shun it according to our rationality. So the Lord will bring us to a state where we stop doing the external thing that gets us in trouble. Now, of course, we have to examine ourselves and know what, it, what is it. And it might not be an obvious big thing that we could turn to somebody else and say, well, you know, they're, they're on skid row. They're obviously worse off than me. Or they don't have a job. They obviously don't look well enough for jobs compared to me. We can compare ourselves to other people, but we can say, oh, I'm doing pretty well. The Lord loves complacency, doesn't he? No. The answer is no. Don't be complacent about your state of reformation and regeneration. Just as much as you can't say, oh, the Lord's not regenerating me, how unhealthy that would be, would also be to say, well, I'm doing pretty well. I, I probably don't need to repent as much as I used to. It might be a good indication you need to repent more on a different level than you used to. One of the things that comes up in this section of divine providence is a, a statement about the nature of the human mind and that interiorly we have this ruling love and it assigns, it says a, a, a vicar in the old translation, the newer translation talks about a deputy. It assigns a deputy to be the sort of the face the world sees. And so we show the world uh, the, the face we want the world to see. And the vicar or the, 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 uh, the external show um, will sometimes convince us so, so powerfully that we're doing okay that the ruling love just sort of hides away and this nice appearance, this nice, this nice person shows up. I think I'm having some technical difficulties. It talks about this and mentions that we can lie to ourselves so convincingly that we convince ourselves that we don't have any, any big evils left. Or that we're, we're better off than we used to be. 
And we might be, of course we want to be, better off than we used to be. But no angel progressing in their spiritual journey will, will rest upon their laurels and say, thank you, Lord, I, I, I've come far enough. This is as far towards heaven as I want to go. These other interior evils and these other things, ah, I don't really need to bother with them. You know, I'm following you, I'm doing these good things, so aren't I okay now? And not continue to do the self-examination that we need to. I want to go back to the section that was read at the end of the Divine Providence lesson. It talks about seven things that people do, seven things that we do to help us think we're okay. See if any of these apply to you. We believe the teachings of the church. If you believe the teachings of the church, does that make you okay? It's not a bad thing, of course. You need to believe the teachings of the church if the church is teaching what the word is, is excuse me, what the word is teaching, then we need to believe the teachings of the church. And here's a, one that is very common. We're doing okay because we're doing good things. You doing good? Helping your neighbor? Helping your partner? Helping your children? Helping your parents? Helping your siblings? You're doing good for other people? You're doing all right then, huh? It's a false teaching to think that the Lord is going to regenerate and reform us because we're doing good. We can't do enough good to get to heaven. We don't do good and then deserve heaven. There's a false idea that every good deed we do is like another brick in our heavenly home. That is, that is just false. We don't do good and then create more and more bricks so that we build up a heavenly home like we deserve a heavenly home. Look at all the good things we did. That's false. Just like simply believing what the church teaching is going to get you to heaven. The third one is uh, to, to know and to speak and to teach other people church matters. Well, you're a good new church person. You talk to other people about the church. That will reform you and regenerate you. No, it won't. Don't think you can pave your way into heaven by all these good things you've done. This one might especially apply to preachers, thinking, well, look at all those sermons I've preached. I, I must be on my way to heaven because I've preached good sermons. Or look at all the people I've counseled and talked to and helped them out in their spiritual journey. I've done these things, so I'm, I'm all right. You know, the Lord's taking me to heaven by means of all the good things I'm doing. Not so. Number four, reading the Word and spiritual books. The, all those self-help books. If you read them, read a whole bunch more, then the Lord will take you to heaven because this is the boat that carries you on the current of divine providence. Just read the Word, read spiritual books. You're doing better. Not so. False idea to think the Lord's repenting and reforming you and regenerating you by means of you simply reading the books. Going to the church, listening to sermons, and especially taking Holy Supper. No. Now, the Lord doesn't list all these things because, oh, he just needs to take up some extra space in the work divine providence, so he's going to list a bunch of things, people. It's there because we tend to believe that we're doing good, we're doing okay, we're getting closer to heaven simply by going to church. Renouncing the world. We're not like those people. That's what the Pharisees and Sadducees were saying to Jesus when he gave them the parable of the lost lamb. Said, Another parable was one of a Pharisee going to church and looking at this sinner and saying, thank you, Lord, that you made me like I am and not like this sinner. The sinner themselves not being able to look up to God and saying, Lord, save me. You know, renouncing the world, looking out at Babylon... And just saying, I'm not going to be one of those people. And by Babylon in the word is represented all the power structures of modern society that can suck us in. By just renouncing the world and saying, well, I'm a good new church person, that does not reform and re regenerate us. And finally, confessing yourself guilty of all sins. You know you're inclined to evils of every kind. The minister keeps repeating that. Yes, Lord, I'm... I'm in, evil, I'm in evils of every kind. Just confessing. All of these things are lip service of the understanding and don't partake of the will. So what is the answer? The answer is given in very simple, sort of three or four or five step 
You know, acknowledge your evils, and confess them, desist from them, and begin a new life. That's the three simple steps. Acknowledge. You can confess all your evils, but you have to acknowledge and see them. You have to be alone with the Lord. And it talks about that in this section, about taking time to be alone with the Lord. Retreat, retrieve, move away from all the activity that can keep you so distracted. Turn off Facebook, turn off your computer, turn off the television, turn off the radio, turn off all the things that you're constantly, we can all constantly be listening to. Take time, take the word or don't take the word, but just be alone with the Lord. Pray for 10 minutes solid, a half an hour, an hour, the whole morning in silence, a day. Retreat. The Lord went into the wilderness for 40 days and 40 nights. That 40 standing for temptations. But we're all encouraged to pray and meditate daily upon the Word of God. Those are some of the you know, laws of life that Swedenborg wrote down. But we're encouraged to stop. Turn off everything. Turn off the external noise in your head and allow the Lord and you to have a conversation. Stop worrying about all the other things going on in the world. Just let the Lord and you be together. Perhaps you could meditate and think about the best father or mother figure that you could possibly have in your life just being present with you. You don't have to physically envision a divine human. You don't have to take a picture that you've seen on the wall somewhere, but just the sphere. It talks over and over again about the Lord's love and wisdom being together as a unit desiring your happiness. You could think about the Son of Heaven. But think about the presence of the Lord and bathe in that presence by yourself with the Lord. Try doing that. Try doing that especially, well, summertime's coming and then we'll have Holy Supper at the beginning of the, you know, in September. It says to do that especially as you approach Holy Supper. I'm not going to tell you to wait that long. Because it is summertime, you should. We often do have more free time on our hands to take a morning, decide how it is you're going to spend some time just being present with the Lord with no other distractions. That means turn off your phone and leave it somewhere where you can't hear it. They'll be okay without you for an hour. This is what this section from the Word talks about doing. Get in touch with the process by which the Lord is leading you in freedom and rationality. Think about one evil, something in your external that you need to desist from. Pray for the Lord to help you because you have to stop that external behavior. What is it? The Lord can only regenerate us in a state where we are using our freedom and rationality, we're not compelled by things of fear, we're in a me healthy mental state, we have to find that, that, that time and place and do the work to allow him to do his work. We have to, as if of ourselves, that means you have to take responsibility. Each one of us has to take spiritual responsibility. It's nobody else's fault if the Lord is coming present with us wasn't the fault of our parents, wasn't the fault of our upbringing, it isn't because of the economic times we're in now. Each one of us has to take responsibility to be present with the Lord, shun one evil as a sin, and it says we only have to be responsible for what comes to our awareness. Examine, do the spiritual work. Observe, as it were, the second law of divine providence, that the Lord may do his work and we may come into his presence and live and dwell in him. Amen. To the one only God, Jesus Christ, our Lord, be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen.
Please bow your heads and join in prayer. Lord, help us to do our part. You give us freedom and rationality so that we may do the part you ask of us. That we may open that door as you stand and knock. You knock within the interiors of our mind, Lord, and we open the door by shunning evils as sins in the exterior. And then you, O oh Lord, can cleanse us of the desires for those evils. You do your work by removing the lusts or the concupiscences, those things that call us to commit evil. You remove them in your own way, by your own power, in ways that we cannot see or comprehend. Lord, help us to do our part by simply refraining from evils as sins when we see them. Amen. Grace, mercy, and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come. Amen.